Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today with another episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. I'm really excited to have with me as my guest, Mr. Matthew Dixon. He helps people with mental illness in developing countries so they can get access to basic mental health care at mindaid.ca. MindAid is the world's first website with all the organizations working on mental health in developing countries on one site. Otherwise, they're scattered all across the web. These organizations use models of basic mental health care that are low cost, proven effective, and scalable. Some of these organizations have been endorsed by Bill Clinton, Forrest Whitaker, Arcade Fire, Ashley Judd, as well as Zach Williams, the son of Robin Williams, and Tim Shriver, founder of the Special Olympics. Matthew has successfully recovered from schizophrenia and has bicycled across Canada. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, thanks for having me on your show. Yes, I'm so excited to explore this topic with people because I don't know that so many folks here in the States and in Canada really have any idea what's happening with mental health in other countries, much less here at home. So Part of what I love to do with this podcast is educate and give people information and resources. But I always like to start our show uh, by finding out more about our guests. You know, tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to do this work that you're doing today. Yeah, so I grew up in Eastern Canada and I had a pretty average childhood. Uh, I was pretty, pretty blessed, had had a decent childhood. Nothing exceptionally good happened to me and nothing exceptionally bad happened to me. I was sort of right in the middle. And uh, I was I was good in school, straight A student, but uh, I went off to university and I was uh, I didn't know what to do with I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I, I really didn't. I I was good. I could have done lots of things, but I never I didn't really feel pulled in any one direction. I got into engineering. I was taking engineering. Um, I sort of got a bit disillusioned with it, or at least uninterested with it. But I decided to finish the the, the degree anyway. It was. Uh, a good degree to ha- good degree to have, and I didn't really know what else I wanted to do to do with my life. Uh, I bicycled bicycled across Canada in the middle of university when I was twenty, and I loved that. That you could say gave me some focus. I don't know if it was really a, a career plan back then. <laughs> Maybe today uh, people could be able to turn biking into more of a, a career, but. Uh, I wanted to go to Australia, go to Europe, uh, do some more biking. I just love that. I love traveling, exploring. But at 22, uh, at the end of university, I got schizophrenia and I went to get help. I voluntarily went to get help. And because I was, uh, I started having some suicidal thoughts and I knew that wasn't good. So I went to get it checked out. Throughout university, I was experiencing some, some symptoms, but they were mild. I could still do all the stuff, like get mostly A's in engineering and bike across Canada. I was on the university rowing team, but I just wasn't feeling the best. And I talked to some friends about it, but back in the early 90s, people didn't talk about mental illness. We knew about mental health and psychology sort of generally, but I didn't know any of the terms like depression or anxiety, at least in the clinical sense, or OCD or bipolar, antipsychotics. I knew none of that stuff. So I went to get help, went into the psych ward in the local hospital. I got on an antipsychotic for schizophrenia. I'm still on it today. And I, I noticed an improvement, an improvement in my health every single week for 27 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a slow, steady, gradual, glacially slow climb out of schizophrenia. But today I'm feeling good. I feel, I've got peace and contentment. I, I have thoughts that actually have a period at the end of the sentence and so the ones that go round and round in circles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I didn't know if I'd ever get here and here I am. So how I got into, uh, into mental health in developing countries, 
At my worst in 1994, a lady saw me walking down the street and she said, I looked like I was walking through a world of flying glass. And I was like, yeah, that's thanks for acknowledging that because that's exactly how I feel. It felt like I was living in a war zone. And I knew I was never classified as paranoid. Uh, I was never, I never had hallucinations. 75% of people with schizophrenia have hallucinations. Those can be any of the five senses. They are usually horrible, tormenting hallucinations, but many of them, uh, well, I don't know about many, but at least some of them sometimes can be wonderful, beautiful, pleasurable hallucinations, which I didn't know about until recently. So I, I never had hallucinations. I never had any problems with addiction or alcohol or smoking. I've actually never even had a cup of coffee in my life, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, I, but still at the same time, I was struggling. It was tough. And I don't know why, but I never looked up online the cause of mental health in developing countries. I never Googled it. I never went searching for that. And many, many years later, I, uh, uh, in a Google search, this TED Talk burbled up into the feed. And it was by Vic, Vikram Patel. And he was the first person in the 90s to model basic mental health care. And it was these uh, models of basic mental health care were, were made from the models of basic physical health care that had been around for decades. There were manuals on how to treat a broken leg when you're hundreds of miles from a hospital or how to treat all sorts of things physical. And he said, well, why don't we do this for mental health? So he did. And they started, they... I mean, these models now are approved by the World Health Organization. They're low cost, proven effective and scalable. And the WHO is trying to figure out the best way to roll them out to the masses. It's, it's a, there are over 270 million people in developing countries with no mental health care. And uh, the, some experts say that number is probably quite low, could be more than that. So it's, uh, so I, when I saw Vikram's, uh, TED talk in 2017, I thought, well, so I, I always felt guilty because I was, I've been fighting for so long with my own recovery, but still making a lot of progress. And I thought, you know, maybe Matthew, you could help other people with mental illness. And I just couldn't, I tried a little bit, but I was jealous of other people who were sick with mental illness and were advocates and speakers. I, I, I didn't have it in me. I read a lot of books on how to do that. Around 2010, I started reading books on how to advocate and fundraise, public speak, make websites, social media, all that sort of thing. But I just couldn't put it into practice until 2018. And that's when I made Minday the website. And I, a lot, there are groups helping. That's the good news. The, the, the good news is there's models that work and are effective and low cost. And people have already put this into place. They've helped thousands of people get their mental health care back and, or get their mental health back and go on to be able to feed their families and, and be more uh, productive in their life when producti productivity is so crucial to their existence in a lot of places. And so that's sort of how I went through it. I, I always thought that I would be helping people in Canada. Well, for me, schizophrenia stole my dreams. At 22, I, I had one singular focus and that was to make it through the disease as the big goal, just to get out on the other side and get my health back. And on a, on a daily basis, just to simply make it through the day. Those are my two goals. And I thought being depressed too, I had depression and anxiety. And I thought, you know, Matthew, that's just such a sad goal to have. Like, why can't you have like other more happy goals? Like biking, biking across the country or something or, or all sorts of things. It just depressed me thinking, oh, Matthew, this is how my life is now. Like, wow, it, it, it's tough. But I, I did have a goal. I can at least say that. And I didn't give up. It was, I was so close to giving up so many times, but one of the things I try to tell people is uh, there's hope out there. And uh, I call it hope beyond hope. When, when there's no hope, when you, when you've given up, there's, there's other things out there that will just keep you going. It's proven now, not proven, but it's well documented that many people who attempt suicide regret it and quite often instantly re regret it. And uh, so think about that. When you're done, when you're just saying there's no hope left, there is. You just can't feel it. Yeah. And there, there is, there is hope. There, there are. It, it seems like there's no way to keep going, but there are ways, and they can come back to you instantly. 
And I just think that's amazing. It, it's sad that, that you're blinded from that, but it's amazing that you have that just that ability to just keep going. Navy SEALs are taught that in their training, they're taught that they are capable of 20 times more than they think they are. And it's just phenomenal what we're capable of when we, when we, when we're, when push comes to shove. Yeah. So, so I, I, so my dreams are taken from me and, but so over the years, I thought, well, maybe I could speak at a high school or something. I, I didn't have many big dreams for me. And, but when I found out about uh, the, uh, the mental health and how it's in developing countries and how it's vastly under-resourced, I thought, well, why don't I make a website with all these groups on one site? It could be, I mean, basically it's a, it's a simple curation site, but it's starting to raise some eyebrows and I'm wanting to, I love being up on stage speaking on stage and screen and uh, thank you again for having me on your podcast. <laughs> but I am I want to be more of a promoter for this cause. Uh, I may be, maybe down the road, I've already taken courses on how to start a nonprofit or a, or a social business. Maybe down the road, I will be having employees underneath me on the ground in developing countries giving basic mental health care. For right now, I'm, I'm a promoter. I'd like to build the capacity of those groups already doing that work and getting more eyeballs on them, more funds coming into them. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I, I, there's so many things I want to you know, comment on and ask you about in what you've said. And, and thank you for your vulnerability, you know, your willingness to share about your own experiences, because I think you're right. You know, you said like for so long, this whole topic has been so stigmatized and people, when I was growing up, you know, uh, you, you definitely did not talk about that. And if you had to go see a therapist, the, the head shrink, you were really crazy. And that was like, not something to share with folks or be proud of or anything. So I really appreciate you and how others in this day and age are really coming forward with their experiences, trying to destigmatize mental illness, trying to show people that there's hope, you know, you're not, unfortunately, sometimes I think even like the Western medical model is certainly, and I specialize in addiction as well. It's like, you have a disease and you're going to have it for the rest of your life. And it's going to get worse unless you deal with it. It's it's not very hopeful, you know, the message is, um, and so when people take that to heart, you know, they can, they can get depressed and ho feel hopeless, like you so well described. Um, so I love that we're here having this conversation. A big part of it is to give people hope and the people who struggle with these issues, as well as the loved ones, you know, of people who often feel really helpless and powerless. Like, I don't know how to support my person. I don't understand what's happening with them. And, um, and it can be really frustrating, I'm sure, and scary. Uh, for people listening, please look up Catherine Goetz. I, I don't know how you pronounce her last name. It's G-O-E-T-Z-K-E, -E, Catherine Goetz. And she has a book called, it's uh, the, the Biggest Little Book of Hope. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And she teaches, she teaches you how to have hope. She says, I can't give you hope, but I can teach you how to have it. And the book is, uh, she's got courses too. And I haven't read the book. I, I need to read it because it's, um, I just love what she's doing. But uh, that's, uh, if, you're, if you're at your wits end, that's, uh, that might be able to put some wind in your sails for sure. Uh, she's been getting a lot of traction with that. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, I love sharing resources with the audience. Um, I am curious, Matthew, you know, aside from the medication that you've taken that has been helpful to you, what other things assisted you in your recovery from schizophrenia? Well, I'll tell you one. Well, for first off, they say with serious mental illness like schizophrenia, uh, medication's kind of a necessity. I'm, I don't know, maybe there are other people out there with schizophrenia who are, are doing well and never had to take medication. I don't know, but for me, I got on it and I could notice a difference in the early years. If I missed a night, I, I take it at night. If I missed a night, I would feel it the next day. I'd feel a bit different. So now about once a year, I forget to take my medication. I don't notice it the next day. But I, for me, it was just, uh, there's one thing I could do. It was simply popping a pill to it that could help. And I'm, it was, that's what I did. But one other thing that um, is, and I, I can't quite figure this one out, but it, it, it helped me. And they told me when I went into the hospital, Matthew, don't ruminate. Don't ruminate. You can't just sit there all day. You have to get up and do stuff to keep active. So I did. I wanted to lie there a lot of the time and just think. 
But I said, no, I got to keep up and start doing stuff. Now that, I mean, I wasn't up doing things all the time. I mean, I was very sick with schizophrenia. So yeah, a lot of the time I was just sitting there, but I tried to just get up more than I wanted to. And around after about eight years, uh, one day I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to just sit here and think. And I was going against doctor's orders. So I did. And what would happen was I'd be sitting there, sitting there thinking. And after, I mean, I'd sit there for hours sometimes just thinking. But what, what would happen is I'd have these little brain waves, these little aha moments in my mind and, about my thoughts. And it was like, it's like when you're sitting in math class and you're trying to figure out a math problem, you can't figure it out. And the teacher's trying to explain it to you. And they try this way or that way or another way to try to explain you how they got that answer. And, and all of a sudden it, it clicks and you had, oh, okay, I get it. I see it that now. And I would have these all, the, I mean, not all the time, maybe one or two or a day or, or one or two or an hour or whatever it was, I never measured them. But uh, when I had that sort of, I could feel something in my head to sort of uh, click. And at the same time, I'd feel sort of less heavy hearted. I'd feel more lighthearted, more buoyant. I could I'd just feel a little bit, a, a little bit happier. And these weren't huge improvements. These were like glacially slow improvements, mm -hmm. but I could still feel them. And it was something I could actually do to get better when you feel so helpless with, with the disease. So I said, I, I, I need to do this. And so I started doing that, whatever that would have been, 2002, I think. Mm -hmm. And then in 2010, I found this book called uh, What Doesn't Kill Us by Stephen Joseph. And it's about post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, people, uh, there's two kinds of rumination. There's a downward spiral, negative kind of rumination, where 20 years later, you're thinking, my life is awful. Yeah. You've still got all sorts of problems. People have left you. You've lost your job. And uh, then there's another kind of rumination called reflective rumination. And I believe that's what I was doing right from the very beginning. And I, and I don't know why I didn't go down that sort of downward spiral, negative rumination, but I was trying to figure things out, like putting pieces of a puzzle back together. And uh, that's, uh, I found that book. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think this is what I've been doing all these years. I didn't actually go against doctor's orders. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in 2012, I started noticing like these sort of more clarity of thought, uh, lighter emotions, uh, not, not once a week or uh, just a lot more often. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's one thing I did. That, and I don't know if, I mean, with schizophrenia, one of the symptoms is disorganized thoughts. I felt like I was trying to put more organization into my thoughts by just trying to sift through things and, and also being able, being able to feel things because with the disease, you can't, you don't have proper emotions. You have a lot of negative emotions mm -hmm. and being able to actually feel things, uh, it's uh it, it might have even been like a kind of exposure therapy. Like I'd push myself so far, like sitting there thinking about stuff for like an hour or two hours, whatever it was. And I'd sort of try to push myself to think about this and think about this. And I, I don't know. Now you could argue, you could argue that Matthew, that was just your brain improving anyway. It's like the whole chicken and egg thing, which came, which, which, which came first. Mm -hmm. Do you, was it your mind just improving? Was the medication working, just taking you along for a ride? Or was it you pushing yourself? And I, I'll never know. All I know is I had an overwhelming desire to just sit there and think because it, it made me feel better. And that's all I know. I, I really had to do it. So I'm guessing it was my effort on some part to, that was helping to push that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate that you brought this up about the positive versus negative rumination. You know, on, on my end, as a mental health practitioner, I often see folks more in the negative rumination spiral. And, and this goes not just for people with schizophrenia. This is like anybody who's like head tripping on, you know, stuff for, through the lens, especially, you know, I work a lot with um, people's core beliefs. And when people are functioning from core beliefs of I'm, I'm worthless you know, I'm not enough. Um, nothing ever works for me. Everyone always leaves me. Like when people fixate on those kinds of thoughts and they really ruminate on these more negative thoughts, it creates, you know, shame and, and fear and, and doubt and all these, you know, really uncomfortable things. Um, and we, that we teach people, you know, like if you're giving your energy into that, it ends up creating your life to be much more difficult 
and you will tend to attract, you know, more traumatic types of situations, you know, maybe you get into like repetitive patterns of abusive relationships or whatever it may be. So we really encourage people not to, you, you have some ability to, with your intention and like, what are you going to focus on? And if you can't get out of that negative head spin, then get busy, get distracted, do something different that kind of gets your mind on something else. Um, Cause I think a lot of people struggle with that and they don't exert kind of the intention or, or, or kind of really push themselves to, to think differently. Uh, they let themselves kind of get sucked in like a black hole, you know, they get sucked into that negativity and they really struggle with that. I, I saw early in my career, I worked with a lot of folks with more severe mental illnesses, and I saw a lot of that. Have you heard of the autotelic personality? I actually have not. No, what is that? Okay. Do you know the term flow in the psychological sense? Yes. Yes. And the author's name, he's got a million letters. That you name. can't pronounce. Yes. <laughs> Mikhail <laughs> CZ something, something, something. That's very long. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in his book, he's got a brief section on the autotalk personality. And that's someone who can experience flow more frequently. Flow is where you're just in the zone. You're often just times flying by, just having a great time. Jazz musicians can, can get into a state of flow, race car drivers, all sorts of people. There's something like something like nine or 10 requirements for flow, things that have to happen. You're doing an, an activity, but you're a master at it. You're just having fun with it, playing with, playing with all these rules. And so, but with the autotalk personality, that's someone who can, instead of getting moments of flow, like, like playing jazz for an hour or two, it's uh, where, where, you have all, where you have flow throughout the day, where you're a master of all these rules of like, I've got to pay my bills, I've got to go to work, I've got to get groceries. You have you have flow for a good chunk of the day. And it's, uh, I thought when I was a kid and a, and a teen, when I was happy and healthy, I was more in a sense of flow. I was pretty even keeled, not all the time. I'd have you know times of upset and stress and whatnot, but it, for the most part, I was pretty darn happy. I was able to joke more, I was able to see that the funny side of things, not worry about stuff. I'm just starting to get into that. Humor was really taken from me uh, for, with my disease. And I, I, I've really laughed. Uh, uh, I've really missed that. I really missed being able to make people laugh and seeing the humor in my own uh, self-deprecation. Oh my gosh, it's been so hard to, to laugh at my own, my own foibles of this, with this disease. And just to be able to rise above it, say, man, ah, you don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Have this, safe spot, have this safe voice in your head encouraging you. And uh, it's it's nice to get back to, but uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's difficult. It's really difficult. I think people have no idea how much uh, of a struggle it can be. And I'm so encouraged that you have found a way to not go down the black hole. And you're, it sounds like you're doing a lot better these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was February 11th, 2021, and my symptoms just stopped. And uh, another year and a half or so went by, and I was sort of in a state of shock, uh, just sort of processing, like, oh my gosh, it literally felt like I'd been blindsided for 27 years, just pummeled, hit from behind, not knowing what's going on. In some ways, I didn't know what's going on, in other ways, I didn't. And just to have that stop, mm -hmm. just to have the, the, the pain, the chaos stop, I was just like, it's, uh... so the last six months or so, I've been coming more out of that sort of processing shock stage and just uh, just having more fun with life, and I'm still I've still got I've still got probably a long time of just thoughts of what did I just go through, what did I learn? But I mean, everybody has this th those kinds of thoughts in your life anyway. You could be thinking about the meaning of you know why did you do this job for five or ten years, twenty years ago, and uh, you know how does that affect your life? Now we all have these thoughts all the time, but I've so I've got, I've still got things to. To think about and learn about what I've been through. I but uh, a good chunk of all my suffering is really behind me. Yeah. And uh it's I'm I'm really turning over a new leaf here. It's it's wonderful. Yes. And thank you for sharing that again, your your you know experience and, and hope and strength and really in all of this. And you give a lot of resources as well, right? You you've named a couple for us, but you also have some on your website. Can you can you just share that so folks have that? Yeah, so my website's mindaid.ca, M-I-N-D-A-I-D.ca, and there is a button there called free tips, 
Uh, it's a list of my top uh, mental health tips that I've been telling people for years. It's mostly some books, some articles. There's a brain health CD, or you can get it on uh, iTunes, I think, and buy it on Amazon. And it's uh, Dr. Daniel Amen's uh, Brain Warriors Way music program. I've been listening to that for years, off and on. I usually just have the CD in my car. That's best for me when I listen to it. But uh, yeah, I, I encourage people to go there. There's uh, a book by Mark Devine called Unbeatable Mind. He's a Navy SEAL. He, te he teaches all these Navy SEAL mindset secrets. Uh, the Survivor Personality by Al Siebert. He studied people who went through the Holocaust, natural disasters, cancer, alcoholism, all sorts of things, and studied for decades how they thrived on the other side of all that. Uh, verbal judo, it's what police, officer, police officers used to deal with people, and it's helped me so much in my life. Uh, verbal judo by George Thompson. And those are some of the top books I've been recommending to people for years. Uh, for schizophrenia, there's a, I've got some resources there. There's a lady in Alberta, Canada. Her name's Lauren Kennedy, and she has a YouTube channel called Living Well with Schizophrenia. And I'm really impressed with uh, the videos she has on there. Uh, avatar therapy, it's mm -hmm. for people who have hallucinations. It can, in a matter, uh, matter of like eight or 10 sessions, get rid of hallucinations. It doesn't work for everybody. It works partially for some people. But I just think that's incredible to actually have hallucinations gone. I talked to a guy uh, recently who said, Matthew, thank you for telling me about avatar therapy. He said the other day, or recently, he said, I decided to stand up to my, to my hallucinations. Mm -hmm. he, his mom was in the next room. She was a bit concerned about him. But when she realized what he was doing, she, she, got a, she wasn't as worried. He, he stood up to his hallucinations. He basically said, you're not going to run me. You're just not. You're not going to run me. And that's what the avatar therapy does. It gets you to talk back to an avatar on a screen with a therapist in another room on the computer. You, you get to stand up and talk back to your, to your hallucinations. And I, I know it doesn't work for everybody, but to have, uh, to have them gone in like a matter of eight or 10 sessions or something like that is incredible. Mm -hmm. Anisognosia, uh, people who think they're not sick. It doesn't have to be from mental illness, it could be from other things, but many people with mental illness don't believe they're sick. And Dr. Yavier Amador has a TED talk and a website, leapinstitute.org, and he describes how you can talk to your family member who doesn't believe they're sick to help them get treatment. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, I, that's, I think, a wonderful too. It's uh, so many people struggle with that. Yes, yes. Oh, wonderful resources. For sure, we'll add those to the show notes. Thank you. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about mind aid and what what's happening there. Um, you mentioned that there are low cost, effective, kind of what I would call alternative ways to approach mental illness um, and mental health treatment that is different than maybe what we experience here in the West, in the United States and in Canada. Can you tell us more about that? Like, what are some of those methods that have been shown to be effective? Yeah, so what they do is, well, there's different ways, there's different models, but uh, one of them, Strong Minds, they use group-based talk therapy with women in depression in Africa, and they get women into groups of maybe eight or 10 or so, and they have weekly or maybe twice weekly sessions, and after so many months, many of them are depression-free, and it's, it's group-based talk therapy, no medications, mm -hmm. and they're really making waves. It's scalable. They're trying to get the larger organizations like uh, UNICEF or World Vision Plan to these, these larger humanitarian organizations saying, look, you're already in these areas. Can you use our methods to help people with mental health there? So they're working on that. And uh, one of the, what, what Vikram Patel talks about in his TED talk is, he says, if you go into a community and teach some of the people there some basic skills on how to treat people with basic mental health care. Uh, they they handpick people with maybe some leadership skills or some maternal health skills. Uh, they, they don't suck just anybody. And they, they give them this training to deliver mental basic mental health care to their own members of their community. And some people in a community might be skeptical, but when they see someone who's been disheveled, walking around, uh, very ill, so many months later, doing well, working in a field, producing something for their family, uh, they start to say, oh, wow, how can we get more of this? Uh, 
So a lot of them like to be local led and uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of, it's anyway. So yeah, it's, they, but that's, that's the gist of it. They're the, the world health organization has a section called mental health gap action program, MH gap. And if you go to their page, the page there, they'll have documents on how to train trainers. There is a document, I think it's maybe a hundred pages long, a lot of images with no words. So it's universal language wise mm -hmm. to on how to treat someone with, with a mental illness or addiction. And you can sort of follow through the guide and they're taught how to use that guide and, and administer this mental health care. Yeah. It's really, it's really amazing. I'm, I was familiar with some of this work through, um, there's an organization called Peaceful Heart Network. Um, Ulf and Gunilla uh, are their names. These lovely folks from Sweden who are traveling around the world doing this exactly this kind of train the trainer model, specifically with um, a tapping uh, technique called trauma tapping technique, you know, and it's involving stimulation of acupuncture points. It's basically self aid or emotional first aid for itself. And they've used it around the world. There's also been a group of uh, therapists associated with the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology, who for years, they started with Hurricane Katrina, and then they went to Rwanda to work with the, you know, children of the genocides there and did amazing stuff and actually attached a little bit of research to it, where they had these kids, you know, picture those like traumatic events, they all had PTSD, and they were having these kids look at, you know, the images of that. And then they would tap, which is a desensitization kind of technique that speaks to the amygdala, you know, in the center of the brain that's responsible for the fight, flight, freeze response. And found that in one session, these kids um, had experienced so much relief that they no longer met the criteria for PTSD. And then they would go a year later and see that those results had been maintained. And They've done some documentaries on it and stuff. And I just think it's really amazing. People don't realize how effective just perhaps just one session with someone or just being in a circle with other folks and talking um, about just life stuff and how powerful sometimes the simplest, seemingly simplest acts can be and how much, especially when there's a social connection right? Because one of the things we know about mental illness is it tends to be an isolating disease and you can really get stuck in your head in that black hole around like no one understands what I'm going through. I'm all, I'm all alone in this and how important it seems to be to have peers or other people who do understand or at least who are there to just listen. Like we were talking about the grandmother benches, you know, <laughs> maybe you can share a little bit about that, but how important that is to just be heard and to be seen and to be um, especially from a space of non-judgment, you know, like not where you're being something's wrong with you and you need help and all that, but just to be spoken to kindly and, and acknowledged seems so important. Yeah, the verbal judo is a lot about just letting people vent. A lot of times people are upset because they just have no one to listen to them. And if you can learn how to listen better and, and just let someone get something off their chest, that, that worked wonders for me when I was really bad. And like, I'm not, sometimes I'm looking for tips. Other times I just need to get things off my chest and I'm not looking for advice. And I, I just need to simply say them out loud to another human being. And that's why like the grandmother benches, I think they started in Zimbabwe and they had grandmothers um, uh, sit on a bench. And I, I don't know how the timing of all this, I don't know if they, all, they didn't always sit on the bench, but there'd be a bench in the community and a grandmother, you could go and sit there and talk to a grandmother about your mental health problems. And they've replicated those in some places in North America. I think they call them friendship benches, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. on, on, another, on another bench note, a lady, I think she's somewhere in Europe, she started a, I forget what she called them, I don't know if it was a loneliness bench or something, but she, she, put a, she simply put a sign on a bench. She, she didn't even ask the city if she could do this. She put a sign on a bench saying, hi, uh, would you like to have a, looking for a chat? And so she would sit there on the bench with the sign on it and people would come down and start talking to her. Mm -hmm. And other people, she's got a, I think a TED talk or some video anyway online about this. And other pe people around the world have put signs on their local benches. I mean, maybe asking the town or city if they can do that and say, hi, let's have a, sit down and have a conversation with me. And people in the community really enjoy that, like uh, to get out and simply talk, like literally just talk with somebody. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one of her most basic, 
basic needs. Yeah. And uh, it's, we're so isolated here. <laughs> We are. Yeah, we have, I think, a lot less he uh, here in what I would call the West, you know, here, especially in North America. We have a little bit more of an ind rugged individualist kind of isolation. I do it all on my own, pull myself up by my bootstraps. You know, we have sort of that, I would call it maybe it's an immigrant mentality from however many people came, came over here um, from Europe and other places. But I find that in other places around the world, community is so much more important. Um, and how I've read about, um, I loved uh, Malin, Malindroma Somme, if probably mispronouncing his name, who wrote about uh, a wonderful article about what a shaman sees in a mental institution, you know, and he was saying here in, in the States and in the West, you know, we, we take people who are struggling with these issues and we isolate them. We put them away in an institution you know, because we don't want to deal with it, maybe in our community, we put them away in these institutions. And he says, if we were in Africa, this person would be getting celebrated, you know, like there's because they see mental illness through a different lens, they see something like maybe psychotic symptoms as the, the spirits are calling you, you know, you're, you're, you're to do healing work, you're, you're to do some shamanic studying or something like that. And they would be taken under the wing of the shaman and the shaman would work with them around you know, whatever gifts are are emerging that they're struggling with and having all these symptoms with, and the community we would be celebrating that. And, and I just was always so moved, like, wow, what a different perspective than what we've had here. And I'm curious if you've heard sto other stories like that, you know, do they see mental illness differently in other places around the world? Yeah, I'm not the I'm, I'm not an official expert in any of this, uh, but I do know I've read some things. I've read, I've heard about what you're talking about, and I've also read uh, that some people just really don't have they, they. There's just a lot of stigma around them that's that's behind the stigma we have here in North America. So it's I don't know. I guess maybe different places are are some are better, some are worse. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah you know and and what can we learn from those other places too i know also in brazil they do a lot more of this i would call it maybe the spiritual work you know looking at um are these symptoms of what we're calling a disease actually something pathological or is it some something else that's about stepping into uh another area of growth or development or or whatever it may be they have um spiritualism is what they call it and okay. they have psychiatric hospitals that actually will have these practitioners of spiritualism or again they might be bring in the curandera the shaman the whoever to also support folks with i guess what would be we would call more traditional you know healing approaches so i really i really appreciate that probably some of the organizations you know that are getting involved in mental health assistance around the world, maybe they're familiar with the local traditions and maybe that can be brought in as well, you know, because I have heard from some folks in, in Africa, it was interesting, um, that they don't, the Western medical model doesn't always fit their philosophy, so to speak, or how they live, right? They see things differently. Um, Dr. Gabor Mate, I'm sure you're familiar with him, you know, he talks about addiction as a, as a social condition, it's of, of isolation and loneliness. And that if we can just like what you were saying, create a bench where someone can just sit and talk and be heard and be seen, that's really what's at the root of so many of these, these illnesses, as we call them, I put that in, in, in air quotes, you know? So I love that um, different voices are being heard now and different ideas are coming out. And you know, to say that only our Western approach is the right way, you know, is dishonoring to maybe thousands of years of, of healing, like traditional Chinese medicine, you know, has been around for thousands of years. And in the West, we saw acupuncture, yoga, we saw those things as woo woo and weird at one point. And now, you know, we've really embraced a, a more holistic perspective. So I just wanted to put that out there as sort of a tangent from this, because I, I think people here don't know and, and part of what we're trying to do is educate and show people there's so many other ways to do this. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, some things work for people, uh, other things don't. So it's all, it's just down to the, the individual. It can all be very unique on what works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Like acupuncture, I've heard that uh, it works for some people and doesn't for others. I, I don't know why, but it's so. Oh, I was going to mention earlier, uh, just, just on the topic of like education, just educating yourself. Yes. on on all the things you can do for me i read books i went to the bookstore i read hundreds of books on how to get myself better and uh, someone i know their their mom when she was elderly had a stroke and she walked out of the hospital pretty darn good after a short period of time and the doctor said it was because she had reader's brain mm. i've googled that term i can't find it online it might just be a casual term he made up himself i don't know but there are lots of articles on how reading is good for the brain anyway. Yeah. And uh, for me, uh, I just, just educating myself on all these different things. It's uh, there are a lot of different things you can do um, to help yourself mentally. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really wise to just learn all the other options out there. So. Yeah. And thank you so much for putting your website out there. There, It is really a treasure trove of information of all kinds and resources. And I love that you've also given, um, you know, a space where people, if they wanted to donate financially to some of these organizations that are out there in the field doing this work, it's so important. Um, and we can help, you know, maybe we can't go to Africa and do something hands-on there, but maybe we can donate to an organization that is doing that kind of work. I think that's important for people also to be aware of that you're you're offering that resource there. Thanks, yeah, it's uh, the website has, right now it's got 10 nonprofits that you can donate to. In the resources section of the website, there are other uh, nonprofits doing work that you may not necessarily be able to donate to, but a lot of them are on social media if people can't donate to them, well, for one thing on donations, a lot of these nonprofits these days are accepting like $3 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's nonprofits like are getting more into the monthly donation, like smaller monthly donations, because it makes it easier for them to plan their budget for the year instead of getting random larger one lump sum donate donations throughout the year. Uh, that's why all these big corporations like uh, Spotify and Amazon, they're all into monthly subscriptions. It just mm -hmm. financially it just works better. It's easier on people's pocketbooks too. I can plan better for $3 a month than, than larger stuff one time. But uh, a lot of them are on social media. If people just want to start having conversations with it, there is an environmental act activist called Catherine Hayhoe. And she says the biggest thing any, anybody can do to help the environment is to have conversations about it, even before putting up solar panels, driving an EV. And I'm, I don't know if what I'm doing is based in science, but I'm adopting the same thing and just saying the biggest thing any, anybody can do to help people with mental illness, mental illness in developing countries, or probably even here at home, is to have conversations about it. Yeah. So I'm encouraging people to check out my website. There's a lot of resources there. And uh, feel free to share posts. A lot of these groups are on social media posting fairly regularly. Feel free to share their posts, uh, share the MindAid website. It's got all these groups on one site. As far as I know, it, this, my website is the only one in the world like it. And it's starting to get some traction. I'm starting to get some people take notice. And for me, I would like to someday be able to go to some developing countries. I may be running a nonprofit someday, but in the meantime, I'm more of a promoter. And yeah, it's uh, I, I would love to, if anybody wants to help me promote, in any way, uh, feel free. So yeah. Yes. yes, thank you. It's so important to get the word out. We for sure are going to spread all this on our, our social media and make sure that people uh, know that this is out there. And if you feel called to find out more, you know, all the resources will be there. Obviously, we'll put them all in the show notes. It's mindaid.ca, and uh, definitely go there and check it out. Um, it's been so wonderful talking with you, Matthew, and I feel inspired by just your personal story as well as what you're doing in the world. And I think you are speaking to the spirit of post-traumatic growth. You as somebody who went through some really awful traumatic experiences have, are now coming out the other side and using that in a way to, to help others and give them hope and resources and let them know that they don't have to stay in that black hole of suffering, you know, that there, there are tools and, and techniques and hope. And do you have any final thoughts for us as before we 
wrap this up? Yeah, if someone wants to take a really simple one-time action, simply just clicking a button, there's a, well, I, I, we didn't get into this, but some people are actually kept in chains with mental illness. They estimate mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands in 60 countries. There's a platform called hashtag break the chains. Robin Williams' son, Zach Williams is helping promote it as is some others. And there's a pledge there. They're looking for a pledge. They, they're needing 20,000 20, signatures. If you could go down there and sign your name, and they are it would help them unchain people with mental illness in developing countries, which is huge. The other thing I want to say is that for people struggling out there, just know that there's hope. I know how how unbelievably difficult it can seem. It seems impossible, but I want you to know just keep going. Keep don't give up. Just keep going. I know you may may not be knowing how to turn, what to do. Just know that there's a path laid out for you there is there's a path laid out for you you can't see it it reminds me of the i think an indiana jones movie where he's he's got across a chasm and he can't see it it's invisible there's the, the bridge across it is invisible he throws some stones out and they land on this bridge and you can see it and he walks across know that there's a path laid up for you i know it feels like you're walking off stepping off into an abyss but keep walking because there is a path there is a yellow brick road in front of you, for lack of a better word, yeah. and just keep walking one foot in front of the other. I know you may feel like you're stepping out into nothing. Just keep walking. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much for being with us today and for all the wonderful work that you're doing. It's really, you are a gift. So I appreciate you being here. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, please do help us spread the word um, with this podcast, share it, like it, comment. Let's get this information out there so more folks can find out about what is happening with mental health, what are some other ways we can contribute our time, our energy, our information financially. There's a lot we can do. You, you may be one small person thinking there's not much impact you can have, but that's not true. You can have a huge amount of impact. Help us with this. I It is my request for those of you who support the podcast. And thank you for supporting the podcast and for tuning in for this episode. It was very special to me. Thanks again, Matthew. And we'll see you next time on Kaleidoscope of Possibilities. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.